Anyway, must, must really thank you for your time to uh, yeah, okay. come and meet us. Carry on. Yeah. yeah, so background is um, basically we all, say most of us from Jane Morgan's um, fans or, or readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how we all came to know about it. Yeah. And um, background, probably we're all grown and brought up in India. We read our Indian history in the background. And, yeah, yeah. and it never appeared in our history whatever we read in our childhood. No. Days. So that's an intriguing point for us to start with this. So that's one of the main reasons why we just wanted to have a yeah, yeah. You know, meet with you and have a chat. Yeah. Um, almost all of us, I must admit, haven't read all of your books yet. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Probably The Great Hedge of India and perhaps the other, other one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so probably we can start from from, from very basic fundamental. Um, yeah. Could you just tell us about your family background? Um, <laughs> I mean, you're covering, because in the book you mentioned that, you know, in the, yeah, okay. in the fine you met one person where you come from Stratford-on-Avon, you know, Shakespeare. I don't come from Stratford-on-Avon, I come from Evesham. It's about 15 miles from Stratford-on-Avon, on the same river. Right, okay. Which well. played cricket against the school which Shakespeare went to, actually. Um, yeah, I went to, uh, oh, you know, to the local state primary school, and then I went to the grammar school, you know, um, in Evesham, which is now comprehensive, but I mean, right. uh, you know, it's, it's no different than it was really. I mean, but it's a fairly old school, I mean, uh, in that, um, well, officially it was kind of founded in 1605, but actually it goes back a lot earlier because it was the, the, um, the school for established by Evesham Abbey. Now, Evesham Abbey was big. It was the sixth biggest abbey in Europe. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but of course, at the time of Henry VIII, the whole thing was destroyed, you know. But, um, um, but yeah, I mean, Evesham Abbey, I mean, the abbot of Evesham was a pretty important person. Yeah. So that's the thing. Yeah, and I went to the local school there, and, um, uh, and, um, you know, in my school holidays, I used to go and work on the land and that kind of thing. So oh. I've done quite a bit of that kind of manual work on the land. Um, people don't do it anymore. Um, you know, all those jobs have been taken over by East Europe. Yes. So, uh, there's no English people hardly working on the land these days. And, uh, yeah, but that was good for me. Okay, good you know, I yeah. Mean, uh, yeah, that was good. Yeah, it, it shows later part of your life you moved, you were you run a fruit farm in um, another county and you broke yeah, this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what happened was, I, I mean, my father died when I was 10. Left my mother with three children of whom I was the oldest. I was 10 at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, and then, um, at the time I was quite keen on going on to Oxford or somewhere. Um, and um, I was interested in chemistry, so, um, but I didn't want to be a burden on my mother, so I, what I decided to do was go off for a year um, to, um, to get a job to work for a year and then apply to university from there, okay? And um, so I, I came to London and worked for Shell oh, yeah. uh, in a laboratory. I mean, things were different in those days. I just wrote a letter, you know, Dear Shell, have you got a job? Yeah, they said, yeah, come and see us. I mean, you know, this is not going to happen. So, um, yeah, so I worked in that lab, and then um, I got this, uh, I'd slightly changed my emphasis, and I got this, this um, uh, place at Nottingham University, actually, to read agricultural chemistry. All right. Okay. Because it was an agriculture degree that involved um, spending a year working in agriculture. So I went to work on that fruit farm right. in Herefordshire yeah. for yeah. that. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. And um, I don't know if it had any influence really on my things. It might have. Um, the owner of that farm was um, the last British governor of the northwest frontier province. Right. A man called Sir James Atchison, mm. uh, who became Foreign Secretary of India. And um, 
so I don't know that. I certainly used to chat to him there, one thing or another. I, I was very interested in Africa. Now, why I was interested in Africa, a bit of a mystery, you know, yeah. because um, I never really met anybody who'd been to Africa. I mean, certainly nobody in my family had. I mean, uh, my father was a bakery manager, you know, and um, both my grandparents, they were uh, carpenters, cabinet makers, that kind of thing. So, you know, we were kind of what you might call upper working class, I suppose. And, um, yeah, so, uh, anyway, the point was, normally in those days, you had a place at university, you automatically got a grant. Not only for your fees, but also for your living expenses. Living expenses right? I mean, the things were all very different, you see. So, um, but what happened was, it, you know, Shell had actually offered me a scholarship, but I said, well, we decided there was no point because my county were going to give me a grant. You know, it was a little bit income related, but as my mother was a widow, I mean, I was going to get the full thing anyway. So, and, um, but then my county turned around and said, well, you haven't been living here for two years. We're not going to give you this grant. And this all happened, you know, kind of rather suddenly one thing and another and I ah, I was completely fed up and I think I'd also decided did I really want to go to university I mean as I say life was different in those days I mean you you, you know you could you get a perfectly good job without going to university you know I mean it was all a bit different so um, and I, I was uh, and I was very interested in Africa I, I don't know why but I used to read everything about Africa um, nobody from my town ever went to Africa as far as I know and um, so when this, um, I had this bombshell about no money to go to university, I thought, oh, you know. and then I relate this in my tea book actually. What happened then was I put an advert in the Times. Um, in those days, the front page of the Times was entirely adverts. Um, and there was a personal column and people used to put rather odd things on them. Obituaries. And uh, I put a thing in there um, to say that uh, I was looking for a job in agricultural management in Africa. Mm. I had one reply. And um, someone got in touch with me and said, I'm in England at the moment, I own a tea estate in Malawi, come and see me, and gave me the job. That's basically. Which year was this? Uh, 1960. Uh, well, I, uh, it was 1960, I suppose, uh, because I went out to Africa at the beginning of 61. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting, because looking at the variety of uh, books you have written, on, um, one on um, two on India, uh, about uh, Puran Devi and the Great Head, yeah. and also looking at um, your uh, fiction works, like the, uh, the East India Company Wife and uh, uh, other fiction uh, books you have written. So, have you always been interested in the outside world in terms of being a globetrotter, trying to be... Yeah, yeah, I've always yeah. been a bit of a traveller, yes, there's no doubt about that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 And you know, it was different, you know, not, not that, I'm sure you know plenty of, you know, your parents or whatever in India have done the same kind of thing, but of course, travelling in those days wasn't like now. Mm. I mean, <coughs> for a start, I went out by air to uh, Africa. Um, previously, even a year or so before, most people had gone out by sea, actually, but I, I went out by air. Now, we had no money in my family. The single airfare was nine months salary. So there's no way I could have afforded to come back if things had gone wrong. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, but of course that never went into my head. But, and I was on a contract that you work for three and a half years and then at the end of that, they paid your fare back, uh, and you got six months leave, and then you, they might give you another contract. That, that was the way it was, you know. But so I went out for three and a half years. Um, well, it's, you know, it's quite a long time. Uh, and um, I had no telephone out there. So, uh, I mean, I wrote to my mother once a week. She wrote to me once a week. I mean, that was it, really. So, yeah, I, well, it's, you know, nowadays everyone would be flying home every year or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a completely different scene. It's a surprise if you don't find an Indian restaurant somewhere in the corner there. <laughs> <laughs> nowadays, but.
not not then definitely yeah because mm -hmm. that has been the uh, the kind of adventurous spirit right for most of them like uh, Bruce Chatwin or uh, uh, Joseph Conrad they they keep traveling quite a lot uh, cross continents yeah they got a lot of English people well, English not Conrad was English but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there is quite a kind of history of that really I suppose you know. mm -hmm. and it didn't seem so unusual to me to be honest because mm -hmm. you know. We used to read at schoolboys a thing called the Boys' Own Paper. Mm -hmm. you ever, anybody ever seen that publication? No, no well, it was a kind of publication for young men. And it was <laughs> full of these kind of stories, you know. Oh, yeah. uh, people going out to the colonies. Because, you know, when I went to Malawi, it wasn't called Malawi, it was called Niazaland. It was still a colony. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, a completely different deal this was. Mm -hmm. In fact, the condition of my employment was I joined the Colonial Police Reserve. Oh, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, there we are. Four years later, they got independence, and everything changed in a big way, actually. But, um, but it just seemed, yeah. Um, you read Somerset Maugham as well. Do you know, I don't know if any of you know Somerset Maugham? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he writes very good short stories, yeah. a lot of them about this kind of expatriate life, you know. And uh, when you read a few of those, it just seemed, you know, you were. You were you just behaving kind of normally, really. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Because most of his books are also about living outside, like when the moon and the sixpence where he tries to um, uh, uh, imitate somebody who lives in Paris and he writes about the living in Paris and yeah. also in Europe. So that, that's that's an interesting bit. Of, because people used to travel uh, to other continents just to explore and to, because that's a different life there, different culture, so they try to uh, go and um, uh, enjoy the culture yeah. and try to, if, if they are creatively inclined, then they try to write about it. Yeah. So that's where the, my next question comes to you as to how you were interested in this, this special history of uh, India. Uh, because this is something that you, uh, we have seen the preface that you have, uh, you have got one of the books and uh, there in the footnote you saw a reference to the H. Um, yeah, uh, but is, is that how it started, or did you did you think? No, that I, you know, I'd gone out a bit earlier. You see, um, what happened was that um, I went to India. For, you know, I was never keen on going to India, not at all. I mean, I was an Africa person, you know, yeah. because uh, you know I worked for thirteen years in Africa, and then I set up an African art business actually in London for a few years, yeah, and then I completely changed career. I decided it was time. You know, for various reasons, you know, this African art thing was only viable because I was in Covent Garden when Covent Garden was derelict after the market moved out yeah. and rents were very, very low. I travelled a lot in, in Africa in those days. I used to go out for three months. I used to take a one-way ticket to somewhere like Nigeria and come back overland and buy stuff yeah. on the way back. So that's the way. So I did a lot of travel. I've been to virtually every country in Africa. So, um, yeah, so I was pretty interested in Africa, but then, uh, the, but then I completely decided to change things and for various reasons I've become interested in book binding and book restoration mm -hmm. and I decided to, it was about time I went to college, so I went to Camberwell School of Art, which is the leading conservation place actually. And, um, yeah, very lucky. They gave me a where is that? Is it in England? Camberwell, yeah, it's south, it's just south of the river. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Camberwell College of Art. It must have been in your mid thirties by then, doesn't it? Sorry? But when you went to school again, went to the college again, it must have been in mid thirties, your mid. Uh, well, I left there just about on my fortieth birthday. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so a complete change. Yes, this is, yes, you know, exactly. like a mega change in my life. Yeah. Um, Amazingly enough, because I'd never been to university mm -hmm. and I was living in London, the London people gave me a full grant. Oh. Mm -hmm. And not only a full grant, they gave me a living allowance and because they said to me, well, you're so old that, you know, you can't be expected to live like a student, we'll give you 50% more. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Those days have gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Distant past, yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that was it. So I completely changed careers. Yeah, that, yeah. that was the thing. And I decided, you know, I didn't want to be one of these people who live in England and was always going on about living abroad. Yeah, yeah. You know, yes. let, let me get into the scene in England. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was keen to do that, actually. Yeah. Um, um, but then I did write that novel about Kenya. Uh, but that was a bit later. I wrote that in 19, 
90 or something. You see. So uh, this is 15 years later, and I thought, well, yeah, when I do a bit of writing or something, you know, I can't think what started. So your interest in, towards India was just an accident at that time? Uh, well, no, what happened was, so many people I knew, these kind of people who were going to Africa and the rest of it, they kept on saying, oh, you'd love India. And I used to say, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, I've read about Calcutta or, you know, whatever. I, why should you think I would like it? Or, you know, or whatever. You know, uh, because Africa, when I was there, was wide open spaces or this kind of thing. I mean, at one stage, I was living on the slope of Kilimanjaro, you wow. know. I mean, yeah. um, <laughs> or, you know, yeah, the absolutely. place was full of game and, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, uh, the idea of some crowded city in India yeah. did not yes. appeal yeah. to me. I, I think, perhaps, I'm just thinking about this market over. Because you, you were in Africa in 1960s yeah. and you came to India in 1990s or something. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps I think if you could have been in India in 1960s or 50s, yeah, well, it might be probably it could be again as a one space. Yeah. In, in Mumbai, I've read a lot of books about uh, what's his name, the Ali, as um, the one that uh, the birds. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's Ali. Yeah, Ali and Ali. His yeah. books, he's talking about. 60s, 50s of Mumbai, yeah. but you can find tiger in, in the heart of the uh, Bandara, whatever. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite vast place those days. So yeah, no, I, I agree, it has changed, but yeah. but there there were still pretty big cities. But yes, I, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I mean, you know, I mean, after all, Dickens was in you know, not Dickens, uh, Kipling. Writing about you know uh, a city of dreadful night you know <laughs> yeah. uh, that had kind of a uh, as Calcutta you know yeah. so uh, yeah so that goes back quite a long time <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love it, so. <laughs> and the only uh, but you know people have been going on and on to me about going to India and then it just so happened I read one of these color supplements you know, mm. I don't know one of these Sunday papers um, it was and it was an article by Norman Lewis. Uh, it was a travel writer I like a lot, actually. And um, he was just saying that how uh, really parts of the south of India, I think he's particularly thinking of Kerala, um, mm. reminded him of the east coast of Africa. Mm. So I thought, well, if it's like the east coast of Africa, maybe I should go, you know, why don't I do that? I mean, yeah, I went to Mumbai. Um, yeah, well... Yes. Uh, it's a dreadful experience. <laughs> You've read it in the book, yeah, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they took me through Deveri, you know. I mean, uh, yeah. I've never been to Mumbai or the strike there. Strike there, that's what they said. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I've just seen this um, thing at the National Theatre, and if you've seen it beyond the beautiful forever, so whatever it is, this thing, uh, this play uh, based on this book by Catherine Bow, which is uh, uh, in the National Theatre at the moment, by David Hare. It's all set in that slum in Bombay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a movie, what was the movie? It's a big hit now. Slumdog Million. Slumdog Million. Slum 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 that also shows yeah. a bit of... Um, a bit of that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. My colleagues just saw the movie, they were like, just saw the movie because Got some Oscar or one nominee. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, yeah. Who, who wants to go to Mumbai? Yeah, 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 yeah. But any ordinary person looks obviously that looks very, very. Um, yeah. Uh, negative. And to be honest, I got a very negative impression when I arrived in India in Mumbai. You yeah. know, starting off going to that slum. I mean, of course, the biggest slum in Asia. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, for, uh, but fortunately, I'd already. Um, Booked a train actually mm -hmm. to go to Mysore. Mysore yeah. yeah, well, that's a whole different game. And then I began to think, oh yeah, maybe India's okay. Just like how we mentioned that um, in the heart of the city, you haven't seen a slum in any other uh, country, even in Pakistan, that's what we mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's in the heart of the city, in Karachi, you don't see big slums. It's no, right yeah. outside. Yeah. So yeah. that's one peculiar thing. Uh, with, uh, in India. So it's still <laughs> the case with the slum in Asia. Mm. Uh, I, yeah. I think we'd love to discuss the, your experience in India later. Before that, what, what's about the African art? So what, can you tell more about the African art, what, what they're doing, part of that? Well, I, you know, I was quite interested in African sculpture, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, I was not dealing in antiques. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, what happened was I, I decided, look, 
I've been in Africa long enough. One of the reasons I decided that was by then I was working for a you see, it, I worked for about five years of whatever was a tea planter, but it seemed as though the days of European tea planters was finished. You know, the way it had finished in India, Sri Lanka, or whatever. In fact, people I worked with had come from those countries, you know. So, and it was, it was also very difficult to get a work permit, actually, just after independence. Mm. So, the way it was all going, it just seemed like Africa had no future for us expatriates, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, that was, now, as it turns out, that wasn't necessarily the case. Mm. And particularly in Malawi. Malawi is one of the few places where there are people still working there who were working with me, English people. In, on the Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's the only place that has happened in the whole of the world. So, well, I wasn't to know that. So, uh, so uh, I thought, yeah, I was quite, I'd become quite interested. I'd bought a few things and uh, I'm quite interested. So, there was some quite nice, uh, you know, very modernist type sculptures being done. Actually, not really in Tanzania, but they were. Uh, they were done by people from Mozambique, but they'd been forced out by the Civil War, actually, um, into Tanzania. And I was interested in those, and um, I was quite interested in textiles, too. So, um, I, uh, yeah, best switch mine off, actually, it's <laughs> not best to go on. Um, um, Sorry to interrupt you. You were there during the independence of Malawi, you said. Yeah. And that was in 65. Uh, given 64, that 64, I think. Yeah. 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 And Zimbabwe continued not to be independent for another 15 years after that. Yeah. Uh, despite being just a neighbor yeah. of. I just yeah. checked to confirm that Malawi was a neighbor of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Zimbabwe. I actually emigrated, you know. When I left England, I emigrated to the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Uh -huh. uh, because of that, I didn't. Uh, I avoided national service in England. I was supposed to do national service in England, mm -hmm. but because I was emigrating to a self-governing colony which had its own army, um, I could do that, and I was liable to do national service in there, although that would have been a lot easier, it was only four months actually. Um, but as it happened, um, they hadn't caught up with me by the time the whole thing that was clear that Nyasaland was going to leave this federation. So, yeah, so I never actually did any national service. And in the tea plant, you said, kind of a personal curious interest, have you met any, um, any Tamil group in, in, in that? In, in, in Africa? Africa? In Africa, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think so. The only Indian people in those days you ever saw on the TSA seemed to be the, um, the engineers uh, for the tea factories. And um, some of those were Sikhs, actually. Okay. Uh, and... Um, some of them, in fact, the, you see, there were some people from Goa, and um, there were some people from the Seychelles, actually. So it is possible some of the Seychelles exactly. people had come yeah. Yeah. from, Seychelles. originally from, 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 from India. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But that was the one job, I would say, you know, on these estates, um, which tended to be done by, by Indians, actually. Right. Yeah. There was a migration of people yeah, from Spanish right, right. in south of India to Seychelles and Mauritius. Yeah, okay. yeah, Mauritians, yeah, there were Mauritians then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this is usually just one family on each estate, you know, because you right. normally just had one engineer like that, right. uh, you know, and the rest of it. So, uh, but actually, you know, we kind of put them up for field management, they were still all mm -hmm. British. There's quite a lot of Indians in there. Okay, yes. uh, yeah, we used to play hockey against the Indian uh, uh, clubs. And I think, yeah. I think from sixties and seventies there are plenty of immigration from African Indians to England, isn't it? Yes. There's a lot of families that migrate from. Yeah. Uh, Nairobi, well, mostly yeah. from uh, from in India, more, India, what you might call East Africa, from Kenya, Uganda. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, exactly. particularly from Uganda. You know. Yeah.
Um, yes. I don't know if we should go there. I, to be honest, I, it's probably one of the reasons I didn't go to India. I did not have a very high opinion of the, a lot of the Indians, Indians. in Africa. All right. Yeah. Because they exploited the Africans mm. really badly, actually, mm. particularly the money lenders. So, uh, and I had to intervene in quite a few cases, actually, um, you know, to get justice for my laborers on the tier states. Otherwise, they'd have lost whatever. So, uh, yeah, I did have a pretty negative view about that. Okay. Although, in a funny kind of way, the Sikhs were always a bit different, in, you know, um, about that. But I, I'm talking about, look, let's face it, the Tamil moneylenders, you know, have got a bad reputation in lots of places. Yes. I mean, in Burma. Burma. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. so, it, it, you know, so, uh, yeah, we have to be kind of open about that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, these money lenders, not Gujaratis, mostly. Mm. There were Gujarati money lenders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't like the Gujaratis there either. No, 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 no. I didn't like the Gujaratis there either. But a lot of them, a lot of them were. Yeah, no, they were indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I said Indians. You see, I didn't say Tamils. Because I don't. They were mostly Gujaratis. Yeah, yeah, they were mostly Gujaratis. Yeah. So the two big groups, I would say, in Africa, were the Gujaratis and the Punjabis. Yeah. The Sikhs. Coming back to your interest with India, so uh, you somebody your friends were, were saying that why don't you go to India? Yeah, and that's how you got interested and came to India. Well, yeah, because and then I read this article by Norman Lewis, so I trusted more than my friends, <laughs> saying that uh, you know, yeah, you, it's a bit like Africa, you know, you know, um, yeah, okay. whatever. No, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. And I believe your first trip to India was not for to. Uh, to find the great hedge, it was for no, a no, at all. Reason. No, 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 no. We okay. You, you, we, we're moving on to that. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So what happened was, I went to India. Um, then um, I was shocked by all this poverty, actually. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, I thought, what can I do about that kind of thing? You know, uh, can I do anything? I don't know really. I mean, you know, you can send a bit of money, but whether that's going to make any difference in India is a good point. You know. So, um, I, um, it, at that time, suddenly, Poole and Devi came into the news. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I never, you know, uh, the original thing, I knew nothing about. Um, but she came into the news because what had happened was she was, had this surrender deal. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, um, the deal was that after eight years she'd been released from prison. Uh, after eight years came up, she was not re released from prison. Yes. She then decided, in order to draw attention to her plight, she'd stand as an MP yes. uh, from prison. I mean, she had no chance of getting in. She knew that because she was against two film stars. Yes. Um, but um, that brought her story into the papers. I mean, maybe it had been the papers years before, but I hadn't seen it, okay, because I wasn't interested in India. But coming back from India, I read this thing, you see, and there was some detail about it. Um, and uh, I thought to myself, well, oh, you know, this poor woman, you know, one thing and another, why don't I send her a note to cheer her up? So um, I sent her a note. I, and I remember I also sent her a postcard of the House of Commons. Um, and um, I mean, I didn't even know she'd get it, yeah. you know, uh, let alone, you know, read it, whatever. But surprisingly enough, I got a reply, you see. I mean, she's totally illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So she, yeah. So then um, I went out the next year. And, you know, we had a correspondence, and I kind of boosted her a bit when she was feeling pretty low, actually, went, because she thought she was going to be moved to UP and killed. I mean, that was basically it. So, um, so I decided to go out to India again the next year and try and visit her in jail. Okay. And that, that they wouldn't let me do that. I went to rally always in jail, but they wouldn't. They were not letting foreigners visit her. But through that, somehow or another, I can't think how now, um, <clears throat> I met her family. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, 
And I met her mother, I think. Probably it, it'll be in my poem. It's difficult to remember all these things. Oh, yeah. it'll be all you understand. Um, and um, anyway, so they said, well, when you come to India next, why don't you come to the village? This is the village she comes from in UP. Okay. Now, I was all set to go to that village. Meanwhile, I was in Charing Cross Road looking at some second-hand books, and I come across this book, um, Rambles and Recollections of an Indian Official. And in that book, it, it mentioned the fact that there was a customs post in the middle of India. Well, I was, uh, you know, I'd, I'd started to read quite a lot about India at that stage, so I thought, this is really weird. Well, why is there a customs post in the middle of India? But fortunately for me, this edition of this book by Sleeman um, was a later edition, which had been edited. <coughs> and there was a footnote to say this is a reference to this um, Imperial Customs line. So and so, so and so. And then it actually mentioned some book where it's mentioned or something. So, um, anyway, I, I kind of. I then looked at the Oxford and Cambridge histories of India, and neither of them mentioned this thing. So, you know, I, I think I mean, this is correct, you know, or whatever. I don't know, you know. And I, I chased it up from that. That's basically what happened. And I, I, I dug out the annual reports of the people who were running this line, this hedge, uh, which are in the British line. I mean, that's, that's, that's how it all turned out. And then, um, I thought, I had no idea it had disappeared, if you see what I mean, mm. at this stage. Uh, but when I looked at, a, at a, you know, at the line, I couldn't get a proper map, but there were descriptions of the line. You had an idea where it was going. You know, and I could see it was going to go very close to Purundevi's village in UP. So what I thought was, I'm going out to that village anyway. When I'm there, I'll say, say to people, well, just take me and show me this thing. Yeah. That's, that was all, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, I also thought they know about it because it's, they're going to be pretty close to this line. Uh, and, you know, and it's, it's a barrier you couldn't get through without paying lots of bribes and things. And also, people are short of salt, you know. So, yeah, there was all this astonishment when I got out there. A, nobody knew anything about it, even when I chatted to old people in the village, you know. And, um, uh, and B, when we went to try and find it, there was absolutely no sign of it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's really how it all started, started going. Yeah. Yeah, it should have been quite a surprise for me. Even in the, uh, within India, not many people are, were aware of this hedge. So it should have been, I mean, considering that the hedge would have blocked all movements of people between East and West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's quite yeah, surprising yeah, yeah. that yeah. nobody had any memory or no, history of it. No, I mean, it, it, it's really extraordinary. Um, yeah, and you know, I thought when that book came out that I'd get lots of letters. Yes. Yeah. We knew all about this. Oh, I wrote a PhD about this. Oh, you know, no, no. <laughs> I did not get any. Yeah. So, uh, we, which, which is, yeah, it's surprising. Yeah. But did, did that start any discussion with any Indian historians or those who are, um, um, are researching about uh, Indology or Indian mm -hmm. here? So, did it start any kind of dialogues with the existing? Indian historians? Uh, well, not really, because none of them knew anything about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, I mean, you know, there is no no one who knows anything about it, really. Yeah. The only... Because when uh, my original website actually had an email link, for mm -hmm. various reasons I deleted that yes. afterwards. Yeah. But, but, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, lots of people got in touch with me. Uh, but, and I gave lots of talks. I mean, that book had quite a lot of publicity. I mean, I was on the radio and, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, I was desperate also to get a photo of this hedge. And I, I, I put out a plea on the radio and everything, you know, can someone send me a photo? I never, I've never got a photo. And then the only person who got in touch with me had something useful to say was a historian of Rome. Mm. And this guy got in touch with me and he said, um, there's a reference in a book by Professor Haverfield, who was a classics professor at Oxford, written in, 
1911 or something, uh, where he refers to this line because it was similar to some barriers which the Romans built across Germany in yeah. the fourth century, the type of Hadrian they kept. Mm. Um, and he tried to get a hold of a photo there because you, you, this is well within photographic time. Exactly. He, he tried to get hold of a photo then. Now this man was extremely well connected. I mean, a lot of people who went out to administer India and studied under this guy because that was the usual education people had, you know, in the early days of the Indian civil service was to do classics at Oxford or Cambridge. And um, none of them could find a photo. You know, uh, he had good connections as well in the India office in London. They couldn't yeah. find a photo. Well, it's pretty surprising. But there must be a photo somewhere, but it's probably a photo of a group, a group photo mm. in front of a hedge. Yeah. And nobody will have any idea this hedge is going off, you know, no, a thousand no. miles in both yeah. directions or something. You know, they won't have that, uh, you yeah. know. Because what one would like to see is a photo from the top of a hill looking down at it, you know, from somewhere yeah. like Jansi or somewhere. But um, anyway, it doesn't exist as far as I know. Because yeah. that's surprising because we now know that we have got a lot of post-colonial studies about India. Yeah. Uh, but even back then, um, there, there are like people like uh, uh, Dada Venerosi and others who tried to um, understand uh, the, the impact of colonization in India. Yeah. Try to put them together in, in terms of yeah. that. But there, there is no mention of um, um, a hedge like this in India. No. Uh, so. And I think the salt thing was slightly overtaken by Gandhi mm -hmm. and his salt march and everything. And to a certain extent that um, distracted people from these earlier times. After all, the salt tax in the in Afghanistan was very low in mm -hmm. comparison. Yeah, yeah. It was a principal thing mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so there you this, this, the whole thing of hedge, uh, I believe it started even as early as 1760s or 1770s during the Robert Clive period. Uh, but uh, when it was oh, actually... Oh, the salt tax did. The, but the hedge... Uh, hedge no, 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 no. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, the salt tax did, but the hedge was built only in the 1850s, I believe. And it, it took a monstrous yeah. proportion around late half of 1880s or yeah, when it was... Yeah, it wouldn't last that long, really. I mean, it started off in the 1840s, and uh, it, the thing is, you know, in general, it was following the boundary between Indian princely states and British India, so, because obviously the British only had control of taxation within British territory. But at that time, those boundaries were altered all the time as Britain took over more and more control of princely states, you see. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, um, the thing there, I can't remember what's on my website, probably isn't on there. Um, yeah, well you need to, you know, if I give a talk in, uh, in Mumbai, um, I have got some PowerPoint, you know, I've got some slides showing maps of different times, showing the way the line changed, actually. The thing that was surprising was that this hedge that ran for 2,000 miles was built exclusively to protect the salt tax in only in Bengal, because that's where the tax was implemented. It wasn't in, in Madras or yeah, Bombay but, or but, but, but Yeah, but of course Bengal, when you say Bengal, we're talking about the Bengal presidency, which is one third of India, you know. It's a bit confusing when one hears of the expression Bengal, uh, because at various times what people mean by Bengal has changed. You know. Okay, so that included the current Bangladesh as well, like together. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Also included uh, Bihar. Uh, in fact, it comes right to Delhi. I mean, uh, you know, because it's, if you look at the line of the hedge in, in, the, in the book there, you'll see. Now, that is basically the boundary of, um, of Bengal, uh, uh, Bengal presidency. Okay. Why, why didn't they think of implementing this thing in other presidencies like the Madras or the Bombay? Could they have... Um, well, um, the 
problem was that they got themselves in a mess in Bengal because they had a thing called the permanent settlement which fixed the land tax and over the years that was kind of eroded by inflation so uh, basically they didn't have much money coming in and they needed money to build roads, schools, etc. So that was really the reason whereas in other parts of India uh, they, they could just raise the land tax. Right, yeah. That, that was the main kind of reason. And the peninsula had sea on both sides, isn't it? Well, there's a problem with the sea um, in that, um, yeah, a lot of uh, salt is made from the sea in Gujarat, but um, it's very difficult to make salt from the sea on the Bengal side because the amount of water coming from the um, Ganges and the Brahmaputra is so great it dilutes the thing. So it's almost impossible to just use the sun to evaporate it, which means you have to put it into uh, into vats and boil it, which means you have to cut down a huge amount of firewood in order to, to boil it, basically. So, you know, it can be made, but it's, um, it's, a, it, it's difficult. I mean, one of the bizarre things about this whole thing was the way the tax was calculated and the rest of it, uh, it became cheaper to actually import salt from England uh, mm. than have it made in, in, in India. India. Uh, I, mean, you know, I mean, this is ridiculous, but uh, that's, the, that's the way it was. So, you know, uh, a lot of it um, came from England. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One thing that you mentioned in, in the book is about how some of the uh, Indian merchants and the princely uh, uh, states sided with the British in Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, most of these, yeah, yeah. In this, and that, that happened in 1860s, 1850s, yeah. 1880s. Yeah, yeah. And now that you have worked in Africa in 1960s, 50s, 60s, and you, did you see any parallels to that? Did you see any kind of pattern there in terms of how um, exploitation happened across two different continents and two different cultures? We never really had a princely class in a lot of Africa, well, a lot of East Africa anyway. I mean, maybe in West Africa, um, places like Nigeria, Ghana, yeah, that might have been more the case. But so there was never there was never that class of people. Usually. So um, as I said earlier on, there was some exploitation of the Africans going on, but not that kind of. Exploitation, not, no. not really. No. No. And the fact that they had to get in a lot of people from the other colonies into Africa yeah. would suggest that they didn't have adequate supply of people who were either at a no, minimum level there. of education for their. No, no, purpose. no, there was no education there. No, there was, there was no education. I mean, um, the language in uh, Malawi, for example, had never been written down until the British missionaries arrived. Mm -hmm. so there was no written language. Yeah, well, a very different situation from India. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, of course, you mentioned about some of the reactions from India once the books were released. Yeah. So I wonder what could be the reaction um, from England? Oh, Did yeah. Well, writing something about British authorities. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to get a number of very rude letters. Um, you can always recognize them, actually. They, they, they used to send them via my publisher. And um, they always had a second class stamp on. Um, and um, they would say something like, I used to read some of these out of the talks I give. If I give a talk in, in um, uh, Madras, I'll, get, I'll do that. Um, you know, I fought in the war for people like you. Why, you know, are you oh, denigrating mm. the uh, East India oh. Company, etc., etc.? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of those kind of things. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. not from the government, not from the, from the British government. Oh no, not much. Yeah. I think it was seen as being fairly objective history. I mean, mm. you know, there's no way. And when it came out, it got pretty good reviews, actually. So, uh, you know, uh, from you know, people who knew. So, yeah, no, I mean, um, yeah, it was, no, no, 
the, the, the British government would never do anything about a thing like that. Yeah. There's no real attempt to um, say really how good the empire was, I think. I mean, there's one or two historians that way, of course, you know. Uh, what's the name of that person I hate? Um, uh, Neil Ferguson. Neil Ferguson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, but... Uh, it becomes political sometimes. I think recently they, there was an argument whether there should be apologists or David Cameron should oh, go yeah. on the front well, foot and yeah, say, no, we have been a force for good. There was yeah, a well, you, you will get a bit of that, of yeah. course, yes, yeah. the thing. I mean, my own, it just so happens I've written two books of which the British come out extremely badly, actually. Both the Hedge book and the Tea book. And they probably come out even worse in the Tea book, actually, than in the Hedge book. Um, but I'm somebody who thinks there's pros and cons to this, you know. Okay. Um, so there's, there's some good and some bad. Uh, it depends a bit on the colony as well, in some mm. colonies. I mean, after all, the British, you know, they, they only ever went to Malawi. Um, they were virtually forced to do so by David Livingstone and you know, people because to suppress the slave trade. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, were, there was certainly no money in it. It was always one of those colonies that lost money, you know. Um, whereas other places were different, you know. Uh, Kenya, for example, was different. But so you really have to look on a bit of a case by case basis. I mean, um, yeah, I don't run down the British Empire. I don't support. It. I think it all depends. I mean, you know, you need to go to a sensible historian who can be okay. fairly balanced. And I would say Linda Colley is probably the, you know, the best person, you know, and she. She wrote a very good review, actually, about that book of Neil Ferguson's on right. Empire, where she, where she points all this out. It's ridiculous to, you know, go overboard on one side or the other, you know, yeah, because it, you have to take things on a case-by-case -case basis. Although I like to say to people in India that, uh, that you know, um, particularly when you're in somewhere like Bengal, that um, Karl Marx thought that okay. of all the options which were likely to happen the end of the Mughal Empire, actually, for the British to take over was the best one for India. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you might have got the Afghans, or you yeah. might have... Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, someone was going to move into that vacuum, actually. Right. <coughs> of course, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a mystery to me, actually, in my travels, um, is um, how... Um, there's not much resentment against the British, actually, mm. uh, in, in these kind of uh, things. Whereas, if you, uh, and when you meet people like Dutch people or whatever, you know, they can't understand it. Mm. Because, you know, somewhere like Indonesia, they really hate the Dutch. You know? All right. <laughs> yeah. I put it down to cricket, but there we go. Cricket diplomacy. In your book, I mean, it was, what was also very interesting was the amount of effort that was actually spent to maintain this hedge because this wasn't like a physical wall where you could construct and then forget it oh, yeah. but rather it was maintain a hedge it. so yeah. you know the 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 it, it, sometimes it, it gets blown off by the wind by yeah, the flags yeah, 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 yeah. Did, did they actually take some uh, dry hedge and tie it by a rope or something or how did they or was it all green hedge which is a uh, growing hedge no i mean start off with a dry hedge it started off by cutting thorn bush, you know, this, um, uh, yeah, various kinds of thorn bush actually, mostly that bear tree look, and uh, dragging it into position. But uh, of course, that's very liable to catch on fire and also to get blown away in high winds, you know. And nobody knows, I think I say in the book, who, how the green hedge started. It could have even started by accident that yeah. some of this stuff just took root, you know. Nobody really knows. Uh, but but certainly the green hedge was more efficient than the dry hedge, I would say, yeah. yeah. But difficult to grow in some places. Uh, well, you know, it's too dry, you know, so it's difficult. Although they did use uh, prickly pear in some semi-desert kind of areas. Yeah. Yeah. Because in one place in the book you mentioned there was a, there was a small forest that they, they might have taken over uh, to build their hedge. Yeah. Um, that would have been one of them, maybe the yeah. green, green yeah. plants. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I know it's a major thing, but if you look at the sums, which I spell out in the book, you know, they made money out of it. It cost them a lot of money to run that edge. I mean, well, it, also 16,000 customs officers, you know, that's expensive business. Uh, but they made money um, because, of, because of the tax, you know, uh, that's it. And there was a tax on some other things as well, and it wasn't so significant, but actually going the other way, there was a tax going the other way on sugar. Yeah. 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 So uh, did it help in sugar control, uh, securing the sugar tax as well? Sugar would have been a much better thing. If they'd put a tax on sugar, that would have been a much fairer thing. Number one is you do not need sugar for your life. Yes. Um, and number two is that rich people consume more sugar than poor people. So, um, whereas salt is pretty well the same, I mean, you can have a bit more salt, but not much more. So, uh, the rest of it, yeah, no, sugar tax would, and there were some people advocating that, but it never happened. But uh, that would have been a better tax. Yeah, that would have been a better tax, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because I believe in, one, in, in the book you mentioned somewhere that this hedge also helped in I mean, ten percent of the income from the hedge was also from sugar tax. Was, yeah. Was there a yeah. sugar tax? There was a sugar tax, yeah. But that it was, was going the other way. It was going into the, uh, oh, okay, the Bengal. Bengal. You, know, you know how the Bengal is like sweets. Mm. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> but as you said, it is, it, it, it's a rich who use sugar a lot, so um, uh, you wouldn't have uh, derived a lot of profit by having tax on the sugar. Well, they could have. They could have raised the sugar tax right across India. Mm. But they could have done that. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't. Uh, there's all kinds of taxes they could have. I mean, uh, of course, I think I'd point out there that the, um, the big landowners in the Bengal presidency, they were very happy with this tax because, you know, they had this fixed deal for their land tax and yeah. the rest of it, you know. Yeah. In fact, some of them were in favour of raising the salt tax even mm -hmm. more yeah. in order yeah. to finance things, you yes. know. So, yeah, I mean, you know, most of these big people in India are extremely unpleasant in my view. And then you get the <laughs> odd exception, you get the odd Maharaja or whatever it is. But, yeah, most of them, they really... Yeah, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 that, that, that shows in, the, in your book how um, this created a chain of um, actions, like, once you have start imposing tax on salt, and there is less salt to be used by the by the poor and by the needy, yeah. then there is a direct impact to their cattle. Yeah. And on on how uh, they they eat the grass and like they, they become um, undernutrition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that has a direct impact on the dairy products and other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah, that, yeah. that's an interesting chain reaction because when when I was discussing this with one of my um, um, relatives, uh, so one of the things he mentioned was yes, maybe there was a hedge. There was a physical hedge, but then right in the, in the modern days we've got a different form of virtual hedges, like um, the, the medicines we use that has been tested on different um, uh, people or, or maybe there is a, um, a drug industry that's trying to uh, corner a certain set of people who have um, um, a problem. Maybe there is a different kind of hedge now where we try to um, sell it to a different uh, group of people. So that's a different take on the, yeah, 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 the modern okay, way of yes, looking yes, at it. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Well, I'll go along with that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and also you mentioned that there's about 16,000 people employed to, to look yeah. after the hedges. Yeah. And, and their wives were not allowed to stay with them. That's, that's also quite no, interesting. Of course, they did acquire temporary wives in a lot of cases. That's because a weird logic of not allowing wives because Having a family would have made them more happier and uh, helped them to do better jobs. Yeah, um, I don't know quite what the uh, argument was about that really. I can't remember. I'm sure I've gone into it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, can't remember. Yeah, I think you mentioned that yeah. it's because the uh, people might, uh, the women might, you know, the people might get started interested in other people's wives or they might start spending more. Yeah, I more. think there was a feeling that there would be yeah. a problem there. Yeah. yeah. Of course, most of these uh, customs officers. Um, for Muslims, mm. uh, and th th this hedge is largely going through predominantly Hindu areas. Right. So, um, in general, one would say the the British use the Muslims as quite a lot as kind of what you might call divide and rule. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of the uh, there was a feeling with soldiers, for example, that you know the Hindus were completely yeah. useless. Yes, you have to have most of them. Not, not at all true, of course, but I'm just pointing out. <laughs>
<laughs> I think one other thing that you mentioned was around uh, uh, having uh, temporary staff um, because they were underpaid anyway, the, 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 the guards and the, the yeah, yeah. were underpaid and having them temporary so that you can rotate them on a year on year basis so you don't have to um, start raising a family there. So that's one, one of the reasons why they didn't want to yeah. have a uh, family. It would have been a problem. They do all need housing and everything mm -hmm. else I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. No, 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 I've got bags here, actually, I'm just sitting just because I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, during the very same period, uh, when the hedge was in its, in its full form, there was a great famine in uh, South India as well. I think you have touched on that in your book, but did not elaborate. So, did this famine had an effect in Bengal presidency? Uh, did it have any effect on the salt tax? Uh, you know? I think it was in 1870s. 1870s. I deal with these famines in India quite a bit in the tea book, actually. Okay. Um, you know, because of, that's why so many Tamils went to work on the estates in the uh, Yeah. Yes. So there were 50 million people. Uh, yeah, there were these big famines. How that um, affected, I don't know. You know, there's never been a famine across India, actually. It's only been in certain areas. The problem is that, um, so there's always, there's always been food in India, but it's just a question of, in farming areas, people don't have any money to buy the food. So, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, but there's, there's never been a famine right across India. So one of the things that um, Gandhi mentions in his autobiography is he was, he was confronted quite a lot by uh, different um, Indian officials as to why he was supporting the British during the Boyer War, uh, what was his reaction to working with the uh, 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 British during the First World War. Uh, and one thing, one popular statement he did was maybe um, some British officials were heard during the uh, colonization, but then as a British system, it is very effective in, in trying to uh, uh, really support India and other uh, countries. So what is your view on that? What, what kind of uh, British system was prevalent in Africa and India? Or do you see any uh, uh, agree to the statement from Gandhi? Maybe the British officials did some mistake, but the British system as, as such uh, is, uh, is trying to pay by the way for improvement across different countries. Well, I think that might be true in the later part of the, uh, the British Empire. I mean, I think once you get past the Indian Mutiny or whatever you want to call it, I mean, that might be the case, you know, because after all, originally the East India Company, they were the collectors, I mean, and everything else, okay, but then afterwards, you know, uh, basically the East India Company was national. Yeah, I mean, I think you had a lot of uh, very dedicated um, collectors and people, yeah. you know, thinking the best. But on the other hand, um, there were major policies from the top uh, which weren't necessarily, you know, going to help that way. And I think to think that um, a country rules another country in order just to benefit the people in that country is a bit naive, actually. I mean, it's not the main function of having a colony. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. yeah. because, do you think it is part of, part of the later realization when, when throughout the world there was a sense of, uh, like, why should the country rule other countries uh, towards the end of the uh, 19th century? But maybe it is normal before, before that. I don't know. I think India is a peculiar case. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to generalize across the two other cultures. I mean, you know, various people have said, and there's some truth in it, that no one exploited the Indians more than the Indians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've only got to yeah. look at the caste system or whatever you need to realize that. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So. So again, yeah, this question actually, what's your view on Gandhi? Gandhi is, is Gandhi. Kind of a, yeah, it's a hero for some people, it's a villain for some people. <laughs> I mean, across the globe. Well, I, in general, I'm, 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 uh, I, I, 
yeah, I, I, I think he's, he's, he's a great bloke, actually. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, that's, that's my feeling. Unfortunately, none of his ideas are now being followed in India, but mm. there we are. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm basically was, yeah, I'm, I'm pro. But he was a bit perhaps naive over some things, you yeah. know, and, uh, you know, the idea, well, he didn't really want government, did he, as such? Mm. Um, mm. The rest of but, um, but, yeah, I mean, as I say, you know, although there were a lot of well-meaning people working out in India, British people in quite high positions, but, you know, all these things like, uh, flooding the Indian market with cheap textiles, and, mm. you know, mm. and manipulating exchange, uh, you know, uh, uh, duty and stuff in such a way to do that, you know, mm. uh, that kind of thing was all imposed really from the host country, you know. Mm. So, thing. and then of course the worst thing, in, in, and this went on very late, you know, and uh, you know, I mean, you don't really see much written in. British books of rest of it, about the Bengal famine of 1943, you know, I mean, which was absolutely terrible, you know, and of course one of the worst people behind that was Churchill, I mean, there's no, no doubt about that, I don't follow this view that Churchill is some great hero in many respects. But, yeah. and then recently there was in a last week he completed his 60s and 80s. Yeah. I mean, of course, he did save Britain during the war. I mean, there's, and of course, to a lot of people, that is the main thing, you know. So, of course, there is that. But uh, yeah, and um, yeah, I'm sure that um, I'm not sure the Germans would have made very good rulers of India. So, uh, you know, in Southwest Africa, or indeed, you know, Tanzania was originally German. I don't know if you knew that. So, um, yeah, they had an important record in these places, actually. So, um, Belgium was worse. Belgium is probably worse. Yeah, Belgium was probably worse. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, as far as yeah, as far as these things go, probably probably the British were the most benign of the big colonial powers. I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. probably. It's true because the Dutch were pretty bad. Mm. Uh, the French have got a bit of a mixed record, I think. Yeah, but yeah. even then, I mean, you know. So, exactly popular in Algeria or something. Yeah, we can always go back and speculate what would have happened if French had ruled the country. Yeah. But then, given this, the small space like Pondicherry and Chandranapur being pointed out presidency and other um, things, uh, I think one of the things that they uh, did uh, French was to, yeah, yeah, French was to um, uh, colonize and, um, and they did uh, manipulate quite a lot. I think that's what the speculation, if you go back and uh, try to extrapolate whatever they have done in a small space, try to bring it up. Uh, I think uh, I, most of the students are in agreement that we could have been um, uh, on the uh, darker side, on the upper side. So then perhaps it adds more strength to what Gandhi mentioned there. Exactly. Yeah. Like a British system, yeah. even though there are some individual errors, but the system yeah. is so system like system as as it, it was a highly efficient civil service, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. you know, uh, which has been a legacy for the new. Um, I'm sure they totally kept to it, but but yeah, I mean, it was a highly efficient civil service mm -hmm. with very few people. Yeah, I mean, yeah. um, very little corruption, I would say, uh, and that was a legacy to India, uh, which is gone. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you speak to old collectors, for example. Um, yeah, I remember, I'm trying to think what his name was. I remember speaking to an old collector of, um, of Madras. And I mean, he was almost in tears thinking about what had happened, you know, really, because, yeah, these guys were pretty incorruptible. Uh, and that's all changed, I mean. Yeah. You know, I know very much from Gujarat, actually, uh, what the situation is, you know. And, um, Talking about uh, Gandhi, uh, he had he had an instinctive uh, feel about a lot of things. For example, he 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 actually was the one to talk about the environmental cost of growth even during his days. But now a lot of people talk about it. Similarly, during his Salt March, Gandhi March, it was very it was very instinctive thing that he did that he picked up salt as the weapon, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. to fight against. Yeah. So, did, did he sense that there is a discontent among the public uh, towards salt tax? Did it exist long time, even though among the common men? 
what salt tax would be. I don't know how much discontent there was, really. I have no idea. As I say, it was quite low at that time. It was like 10%, I think. Um, yeah. But it was obviously, it shouldn't be taxed, you know. It should mm. be free, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but whether with a small tax, it's a bit like books, you know. Should books be taxed or not? I mean, in some countries in Europe they are, and in some countries they're not. Um, but um, I think he just used it to a certain extent as a stick to beat the British with it. I think with the textiles that was a bit different. But no, I think he was a, a great man, really. And, uh, yeah. Another person that you have also mentioned in the book is about A.O. Is A.O. Hume? Hume. Hume. Oh yeah, well, he was, Hume. well he's a very interesting guy yeah. because of course <laughs> Obviously, I cast him as a bit of a villain in his book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he was uh, uh, a hero. He was a hero in the Arctic books. But, uh, but uh, look, he had a pretty good side to him as well. Uh, so, uh, and I think also he changed his views quite a bit as he got older. Yeah. Not there. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm certainly not going to be slagging off A.O. Uh, Hume, but it doesn't come out well out of this book as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for Indians, I think the two, two things come to our mind when we talk about A.O. Hume. Yeah. This Indian National Congress, yeah. that's the kind of negotiation he tried to bring on to the yeah, yeah, yeah. The second thing is, is he was one of the greatest ornithologists. Yeah, 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 yeah he was. Yeah, yeah. yeah and very, he, very, he did very, document quite a lot, and uh, he yeah. has been an inspiration to Sandy Mali. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. these are the two things that always come to our mind yeah, when you think about A.O. Hume. I was interested to see, actually, that his anniversary uh, of, his, of his death, um, which was fairly recently in India, you know, the hundredth anniversary, got very little publicity. Yes. Yeah. And I, I wondered why this was, and I decided it might be because uh, the Congress, which was in power at the time, um, is being run by a foreigner, mm -hmm. and they didn't really want to draw attention to the fact that it had been founded. A slightly cynical view of mine, but there might be some truth in it. Yeah. Because uh, earlier anniversaries of his had been commemorated and there have been stamps issued in one thing or another. But, mm. uh, yeah. so in, in your book, you mentioned about the, uh, the corruption that happened in, in the yeah. So I, I didn't I didn't read the uh, the book on tea, the tea or pulan Devi. So I don't know how much you have mentioned touched upon those subjects there. Mm -hmm. But what is in your view what is, what what is thing what do you think is the basis for all this corruption? Um, well, it's a good question, today? really. I mean, there's always corruption. I suppose um, you know to some extent. Um, I don't really know. Uh, as to why you do get the impression that India is highly corrupt, actually. Yes. One has to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, more so than other countries I'm familiar with. Yeah. Although I think across the world there might be a growing amount of corruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly been growing in England. But. Um, That's surprising. I wasn't aware it's growing in England. <laughs> Sorry? I'm, I'm not aware that it is growing in England. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I mean, in that uh, it's a bit indirect in it, mm -hmm. because of our history of not having much corruption. Yeah. But but you know, in the old days, uh, for instance, someone would rise up through the civil service, and then when he was sixty, he'd retire and he'd live on his pension. Mm -hmm. Now, say he was a senior civil servant in the Ministry of Defence, he might well go and work for. Uh, a defence firm, um, which yeah. previously, you know, and you, you wonder whether he could be given totally impartial judgments in, in in the past, you know, and a lot of these guys have gone to work for merchant banks as well. Mm. I mean, you just look at the record. Actually, the present um, head of the civil service, it's not good when you look at it actually, mm. uh, and that is a you see that didn't happen. If you go back a lot, it happened a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a famous um, a book by a British historian called Sir Lewis Namier, which is called A History of Politics at the Accession of George III. 
and uh, namely looked at various kind of historical events which have been described in such and such a way. But then he started to delve into the correspondence of these people and the correspondence of their relatives and the correspondence of their mistresses and found that, you know, there was a lot of corruption, although it didn't appear so on the surface. You know. And uh, in the preface to that book, he has a very nice sentence. It says, um, to think that a man goes into politics in order to benefit humanity is rather like imagining that when a child dreams of a birthday cake, he dreams of it that others may eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, there has been a rise in corruption in England, I think. I mean, you've only got to look, you know, quite a lot of those um, ministers, for instance, in the Blair government, you know, I mean, uh, quite a lot of them now are working for private health companies. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which was completely against, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm talking about people who've been ministers of health or whatever it was, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or uh, home secretaries uh, moving into private security companies. It's been quite a lot of things. So, uh, that, that would have all been regarded as not very good actually yeah. a few years back but of course relatively speaking a few years back senior service servants were paid a lot <coughs> in relationship to other people mm -hmm. so some of it's to do with that possibly that you know this, uh, they look around and they just see people who are, you know who are in the city or something who are just making so much more money than they are okay. yeah. and maybe that's the same a bit in India but mm -hmm. um, I don't know it's got a long history in India isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite a lot, as you mentioned, in, in the recent uh, past yeah. in India. Yeah, I, I, when I, you know, I mean, I know, I, I go to parties, you know, in uh, Gujarat, I see people, and then a guy will be talking to me about he wants to build a petrol station somewhere, mm -hmm. and then I see him afterwards, how do you go? He said, well, I went to see the, um, uh, the, the minister, you know, and he just said to me straight up, uh, well, how much are you going to give me? Mm -hmm. End of story. Uh, you know, uh, now I don't think collectors, that was the collector who got to see. I don't think collectors were doing that um, at the beginning of uh, Indian independence. Mm -hmm. I can pretty certain they wouldn't. Yeah. yeah, no, there has been a marked uh, deterioration in the country. Have you, uh, as part, sorry, going back to the head, yeah. as part of your research, have you checked if any contemporary Indian literature around that time spoke about this at all? Because there were some books in the Bengal presidency from uh, one I know, Bunkim Chandra, probably, and I'm sure there must be more. Yeah, well, I haven't found anything. Uh, okay. But if you find anything, you, I'd be very grateful if you drew it to my attention. But I've not actually found anything. No. That's, a, that's a good point. Usually, mean historically, you know, either you have your reference books, or as you see, found, try to find mm -hmm. some records and stuff. At the same time, the fictions return are touched by my from um, period, or fictions pointing to that period, also would have an opportunity to capture those things. That's um, whether it could be off of fiction or non-fiction, but you know, kind of a reference. I yeah, I mean, there are the odd things. Uh, you know, like um, there is um, a story about the salt tax in um, one of Premchand's uh, uh, um, short stories. It's called the, tax, the salt inspector, or something like that, okay. as I recall. Yeah. Right. So there are the, uh, yes, the odd thing, um, and there are references to the salt tax. Uh, I mean, I can't remember now exactly what there is, but I'm sure, for instance, in uh, Romish Dutch, for example, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you'll 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 find some stuff there. But but as far as I, I'm pretty well, I know there isn't in in, in Dutch books. There isn't actually any description of the hedge, you know. They, they refer to the salt tax yeah. and its negative consequences and the rest of it, but nobody's gone into the whole business of this hedge business. Right. Cool. So, if you have any anything, I don't want to keep trying to uh, have too tired. It's going to be more than an hour, right? Yeah, I don't want to. Perhaps just the last few things, I mean, apart from the hedge now. Yeah. Um, you've been working in libraries for. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 but not a librarian. I want to make this quite clear. Right. Yeah. Do I look like a librarian? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, I don't, yeah. very useful. Yeah. My research is working on Of course, yes, yeah. I mean, in fact, you mentioned that you've been in Tim's book, um, the paper at Cathedral last that you've been there. Uh, well, I wasn't there. I, I actually just. When I left Camberwell, I then became a freelance uh, book and archive conservator. Right. And I did some work for a thing called the Council for the Care of Churches. Okay. okay. Um, and one of the jobs they financed was to work on that library in Chelmsford Cathedral. It's right. a library, I don't know, when you. You know Chelmsford Cathedral? Of course, yes. Yeah, okay. You've got to go in the entrance there. There's some stairs going up on the, on the right. right there, and there's a library there. And it's a library which some vicar um, left there. I don't know what they were talking about. It was quite early. I mean, I think we might be talking about 1690, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, um, he left that thing there, and it could be consulted by the parishioners as well, you see. Right. That, that was unusual. I mean, obviously it was very common for vicars to have their own books, but it was unusual to set up a library for other people to think. Yeah. And there's some interesting books there, actually. Right. Yeah, they were pretty valuable kind of books of, of the time. So, uh, and I, I, I repaired a number of those, you know, because they, they'd fallen into poor condition or whatever it was. Right. So I did a number of things, and then, uh, I work freelance. I I um I did quite a bit of work. I did a lot of Islamic work actually. Mm -hmm. I used to um uh, I used to do quite a lot of work for Sotheby's Islamic department, and um, I became quite interested in all that thing. Uh, and in fact, um, the main Quran, which is in Regent's Park Mosque, I restored that book. Um, and that's a really old book, that is. That's a Mamluk Quran from the 12th century. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, when I say restored, actually, a friend of mine did the paper restoration and I did the binding, you know, but uh, we split it between us. And, uh, but I did a number of uh, very nice um, Persian books that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I did quite a lot of stuff. So, yeah, the question was actually. Um, in modern day, yeah, uh, um, there are a lot of um, uh, I wouldn't say disturbance, but a lot of attention-seeking things like electronic books or gadgets or you know, oh, yeah. so many uh, attention-driving things yeah. in, in for the yeah. young generation or even for old generation. Yeah, yeah. So how do you see that? I mean, the three well, so I'm glad I did cons conservation when I did. You see, when I went to the university library, and uh, I've been for the last ten years in my working life, um, I basically was repairing stuff. And putting it in good condition. Nowadays, there's so much emphasis on digitalization, and digitalization sometimes requires some temporary repair or something in order to do the digitalization. Virtually every conservator is being diverted into that, mm -hmm. and they have lost the skills of actually doing proper repairs on old stuff. Right. Uh, that, that skill is. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but I see that need for that even now because one of my um, uh, friends in India, he is a collector of books. He has been collecting books for, uh, for 50, 60 years now. Um, so his main problem is because of Indian summer, we get a lot of uh, uh, mines and holes in the books. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was asking for uh, any ways to preserve it from, from here in UK if he can uh, send the books here. And there is, if there is any way of preserving because it's all old. I mean, there are people. So that's 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 a surprising thing because the, the need for it grows every day. And uh, there's still there are like racks and racks of books, as you mentioned, nine miles of books in uh, the London uh, uh, British Library and other. Yeah. So the need for it grows every time. Yeah. And I see that as as one area which. Um, It'll come back in yeah. when they finish this digitalization. But mm -hmm. at the moment, there's this massive emphasis on digitalization. digitalization. And of course, I use digitalized stuff. I mean, it's pretty useful. I'm, yeah, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying it isn't, you know. But nevertheless, the interesting thing is that digitalization tends to drive people, uh, more people, to go and see the original, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 you know. The amount of people want to see an original book now has gone up as a result of digitalization. Um, and some of those books are really falling to pieces. You know, uh, and uh, there's probably a limit 
as to quite how much information the digital thing will pick up actually. But, yeah. 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 Around this restoration, so one thing that... Um... What about, you know, another point, quick point, yeah. Yeah. what about when the whole system gets blown up? Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it's one of these things we talked about when I went to this nuclear thing. You know, yeah. you, uh, the whole World Wide Web could one fine day just yeah, be well, totally yeah. go. I yeah. can assure you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it may not happen, but it could happen. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. carry on. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, as, as about uh, asking about the family histories because. English literature has one side of it is around family histories. Yeah, yeah. So you've got loads of it, like a lot of records of how the life was 100 years ago. Yeah. Do you think that the tradition is still continuing? Is it, maybe it is in the blogs or other. It has, yeah, it but, but, diversified but, but, but a lot of that stuff is probably disappearing. I mean, it's amazing how many people are taking photos all the time when you go around. But then you ask someone for a photo which was taken 10 years ago. No, that would be. Yeah. I'm not saying it's not around, but they can't do it. Um, whether it is, I don't know. I keep a daily diary and I've got a stack now coming about this high of A4 oh. pads. <laughs> but I mean, whether anybody else does that, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because that, that tradition is going dying down, I could see that. Uh, when, when we have to it look is, at the uh, I think it if emails could be preserved, um, people are writing more than they used to actually. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of interesting in a way. Yeah. So a lot of stuff which would have been, you know, people put stuff in emails now, which they might perhaps have just made a phone call or yeah. spoke to someone about, or you know, uh, uh, it's probably quite important to do that. But how you do it and preserve people's anonymity and mm. privacy and things, you know, well, it's the kind of thing we're arguing about with security services. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, of course, in your writing experience, you have done both fiction and non-fiction. Yeah. So there are two questions that come out of it. So how do you, uh, what do you call yourself? Do you call yourself as an historian or? Um, no, I don't, I don't actually. I, 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 what do I call myself? Um, uh, writer, I think. Writer. Yeah. Yeah. And do you see a difference in in your um, thinking, in your thought process as to how uh, the fiction works and a non-fiction works? What, what um, well, it's interesting, really, because obviously most of my emphasis has been on um, non-fiction. But um, novels have to be structured. You know, there's got to be a beginning, a middle, and an end, uh, famously, as they say. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for structuring history insofar as you can within the time framework in a similar way. Um, so as the book has more impact, but I mean uh, that needs a bit of thinking about, of course. So you really do that. Um, I mean, there needs to be a story, even in a history book. Otherwise, it can be pretty boring. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, one of the best writers, probably, although of course terribly anti-Indian, um, is Macaulay. That brings the directly to the question of who, who has been your influence in writing, in English writing or in Indian English writing? Well, um, I think possibly because of my earlier interest. When I started, I thought, look, I'm coming into this very late in life. Uh, you know, first thing is, I want a simple style. Mm. You know, and I've always actually got tended to go for that. I don't like highly ornate writing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I analysed actually some Somerset Maugham things. Admittedly, they're short stories, it's a bit different, but uh, just to see precisely how his sentences are structured in the rest of it, and I find that useful, actually. Uh, and uh, um, I'm an admirer of people like George Orwell, or whatever, mm -hmm. which, uh, yeah, I don't like very um, over-elaborate writing, actually, and I find, uh, yeah, I read quite a lot of Indian stuff, and what I rather object to these days is so many of the, the books which are now available are about the Indian experience mm -hmm. overseas, which, I mean, and the vernacular books are being rather ignored, you know. 
uh, as a result of that. And I think some of the best books uh, written in India. I mean, um, yeah. So um, I think my favourite Indian novel is um, a Rag Devari by uh, Sri Lal Shukla. Yeah, you see, that's my that's idea of the book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That has a tangential way of how to approach Indian society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All Indian politics is some cynical, book. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the same question actually, if I have to be a delicate one. Do you, do you receive any, um, any financial support or no, any, no. from any organization? No, uh, no. The hedge book made a bit of money. Right. Mm. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, <coughs> I mean, we're not talking about a huge amount of money, but yeah, it makes some money. But I, I couldn't have done it all without, uh, without a job. Um, when, you know, that publisher has just been taken over by a bigger American publisher, but I mean, over the years, constantly published in quite a book. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when they took this book on, the, the owner of that company told me, no one on our books can make a living out of writing books. Mm -hmm. right? We do not have a writer on our books. Mm -hmm. uh, um, some of them do actually make money out of other writing. They might do, you know, journalism yeah, or whatever, you know, to add it up. But, uh, but most of most them, we're not going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, we're certainly not going to make much money in India, because <laughs> Indian publishers are really remarkably ungenerous, actually, mm -hmm. you know, I'd say, uh, in general. So we have a different opinion in India, we have the view that in, in Western society you could easily make money out of writing. Whereas it's not so in India because then not many people buy books. Yeah. Buy books and so. I mean some books make a lot of money in England, you know. I mean I'm not saying they don't, you know. I mean no doubt Jeffrey Archer's made a few pennies, but you know uh, <laughs> mostly for sales in India of course. Yeah. But uh, you know. This goes to prove how the popular perception is, is oh, against yeah. wrong. But most, yeah. most, most yeah. books don't make much. I remember reading not so long ago that, you know, of the six books which were shortlisted for the Booker Prize that year, until they were shortlisted, and you're, you know, you're only shortlisted after it's been printed for you know, six, nine months ago, none of them had sold over 1,500 copies. Yeah. I mean, th there are some cases, you know, that the background of my question was there are some cases and a particular, um, I wouldn't say charity group, but there are certain, some best nurse, some um, shadow groups, fun people to write about a particular theme or a particular subject. No, oh, we'll put them um, in touch with me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, so, just generally saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there are, there are a few, few nices in, 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 in Tamil Nadu or in India. But, um, but nobody can go to the root, roots of that and prove it's right or wrong. Okay. So, um, that's where another way of people um, say, people against the popular the belief. Why, like, for money. instance, there might be, what, some kind of right-wing Hindu people, for example. Correct. Yeah, 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 good example, yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that. Or indeed, Muslim people. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think one of the things you mentioned was that you read um, uh, Jay Morgan's Forest novel. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. that a lot. Yeah. 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 I don't know why. I mean, some of you guys are in IT, aren't you? Well, maybe you're all in IT. I don't know. Well, I think so. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. Okay. Yeah. For some yeah. reason, uh, on Kindle, that book is not very well formatted. Right. Um, now, I don't know why that should be, because I put a book up on Kindle, as right. you know, not so long ago. And I found, you know, I, I just delivered it in Word, and it's really come out, as far oh. as I can see, no problem. Yeah. Uh, I wondered whether it was, that book was not delivered in Word, you know, because I know quite a lot of people in India are not using Word, they use some open source type yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's surprised, but it's an English, English version. Yeah. Yeah. It should be, should be proper, because Kindle doesn't support Tamil. Um, um, you don't see much. Many no, it's in English. It's in English, English, but but but, but, but yeah. you've got to deliver it to them in a certain format, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. But then be that's become a lot easier. I mean, yeah. you know, you just I just delivered mine uh, in a Word document. There's one or two things about what you need to do 
for indenting or whatever. But anyway, have a look at it. Sure. You'll see. And I, you know, I mean, you guys are in the business. Fix it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is he having anything else translated? Um, no, I think there is an elephant doctor has been translated. Short, short story. Short stories has been translated. Oh, it is a short story thing. Yes. Yeah. Quite available in hard copy. Uh, it's, I know, I'm not very sure, it's in, in, in Tamil, but also in, it's Probably like it's in the PDF file. That, that would be uh, what? Sure. in PDF file in electronic format. It's okay. not, not so in, in electronic in, format. In electronic I don't format. think it's been published in Kindle. No. It's not in published in Kindle. Not in Kindle. Yeah. So, how do I read that then? Uh, I can send it. You can send it to me and yes. I can see it on a computer then. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can so I could actually put it on my Kindle. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's in a PDF file, you can just copy it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I did enjoy that book a lot actually. Right. Yes, yeah. very, very good book. Is that typical of this kind of writing or the forest? Yes, but, but we don't know how it has been translated. Yeah, we have a written translation, but in, in Tamil it's one of the master, masterpieces. Yeah, well, I liked it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Does he often write about this kind of tribal thing and everything else? No, he, he writes a lot of variety of subjects, really. So, but the that's tribe is his source, yeah. That's his yeah he, he comes from a place near Naruko, so that's, that's where he has got um, a rich background with the, the forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of uh, background with the, with, the, with the trees and the people who live there. Yeah, yeah. And he, sure. he has seen yeah. the transformation from. Yeah. In fact, one of his first novels is a, is a book called Rubber. Um, so that's about how the, um, the rubber plantations have uh, been right. um, exploited. And so he is, he is to, in fact, I can say he's, he's more um, uh, environmental in terms of how um, the forests have been converted to okay. trees and what kind of um, activities. Yeah, well, this is kind of area I'm quite interested in. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, do something about that. He has also written a novel about famine of, great famine of India, eating. The, the one that occurred in the South Korean 70s, yeah. 1870. Yeah, yeah. Probably that might get lost. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've had to touch on famine in one or two of my books. I mean, I could write it on here. Famine in India, I could probably write a fairly good book, actually. But yeah. the thing, I'd have to fill my mind with that for a couple of years, three yeah. years, or something yeah. like that, you know. And to be honest, do I want to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's just a personal thing. Yeah, yeah. I think there is one of the popular um, you know, English books, like the Churchill, uh, the Great Famine of 1943. It's been translated to Tamil. Was it? Yeah. Some of the stories from the 1870 famines are really horrible. Yeah. Uh, it's so, <laughs> so horror yeah, yeah, yeah. too. Yeah, the whole thing is absolutely, absolutely terrible. But I mean, um, I mean, I've just written another book, and I'm looking. I thought I had a publisher, but it turns out I haven't got a publisher, right? Um, and um, this is a book about all the European invasions of India from Vasco da Gama through to Clive. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about the consequences of Clive taking over Bengal and the famine that then erupted there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of eyewitness accounts of that uh, famine, and now those are. Pretty with three Yeah. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, anything or we can uh, maybe we can chat uh, later lunch as well. Yeah, no. Just, <laughs> just the last one about yeah. um, uh, you I haven't read the book on Pulan Devi. Um, but I, I know her story how it how it ended and everything. Yeah. So when you heard about it, what was your reaction? Well, I was pretty upset. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, I was working in the library and someone came and told me. Yeah. So uh, I took the rest of the day off. Yeah, I was pretty upset. Because I've been staying with her only about a month before she was killed. Oh, Because yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I normally stayed with her when I went to India. Yeah. I mean, not all the time, but you know, and we travelled a lot together. So, um, yeah, that was a bit upset. What's your take on Pulan Devi in terms of her life and the whole thing? It's a long story. It's a long I mean, story. You have to, okay, you you have to read the book. book. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, all I can say is, a pretty remarkable and robust woman, and you know, not many people would come out of uh, what happened to her and still be quite amusing and yeah, yeah. Uh, quite good company. You know, I mean, really. You know, I mean, I can think of people who just had quite small things happen to them and they've gone to pieces. Correct. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 From the very yeah, beginning, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but you'd have to look at the book. Sure. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you.